Hello, I'm violinist James Ennis, and it is my great honor and privilege to be performing the 10 Beethoven sonatas for piano and violin during the 2019-2020 season at the beautiful Wigmore Hall. Uh, with my pianist friend and colleague Andrew Armstrong, we'll be performing the sonatas over three dates. The first is October 10th, where we'll be performing the first four sonatas. Then on February 13th, we'll play the middle sonatas 5, 6, and 7, and we'll be finishing the series on June 4th with sonatas 8, 9, and 10. Beethoven's first three sonatas, Opus 12, mark a very important moment in the development of the piano and violin sonata. Mozart's final sonatas had begun to explore a very equal relationship between the piano and the violin, but it was really in Beethoven's Opus 12 that the violin became a truly equal partner, a equal in presentation of the melodies, equal in virtuosity. They're immensely virtuosic works, uh, surely written at least in part to show off Beethoven's incredible skill as a pianist upon his move to Vienna. The opening of the first violin sonata is quite a declaration for the young composer. As was typical for Beethoven's chamber music, he wrote his sonatas or published his sonatas in sets. The three sonatas, Opus 12, are complementary. The first sonata is very friendly, very virtuosic. The second sonata is really full of uh, tremendous charm and wit and beauty and is somewhat gentler than the outer sonatas. The third sonata, which is one of Beethoven's most performed, uh, is extremely virtuosic for both instruments, uh, particularly the, the piano. Uh, my, wonderful pianist and colleague Andrew Armstrong is uh, going to have a lot of fun with that one. The third movement, Rondo, has a very memorable theme that many of you may know. The fourth and fifth sonatas have separate opus numbers of opus 23 and opus 24, but the thought is that they were actually written as a set, and they are very, very different. The fourth in A minor is one of the most dark and turbulent of the set. Um, the piece ends softly, it almost disappears uh, into nothingness, whereas the fifth sonata uh, is the famous Spring Sonata, a title that was not given to the piece by Beethoven, but that has stuck and uh, the piece has become really one of the most beloved pieces in the violin piano repertoire. Uh, the very friendly and ingratiating theme of the first movement is particularly memorable. Beethoven's Opus 30 sonatas, of which there are three, also show a great deal of variety. The first sonata, the A major, is one of his most beautiful and lyrical pieces, uh, predominantly lyrical and very friendly, few moments of turbulence, whereas the second sonata, the C minor, Opus 30, number two, is one of the most dramatic pieces Beethoven ever wrote. One can think of it in the same category as uh, the Tempest Piano Sonata. Uh, it's a piece that broke new ground in terms of uh, ensemble virtuosity. And then the third sonata, the eighth sonata, is again one of the more friendly sonatas. It uh, is very beautiful and almost looking backwards in a certain way. Moving on to the ninth sonata, which is arguably the most famous of the set, that is the so-called Kreutzer sonata, that uh, is a bit of a misnomer in that it was written for uh, a different violinist uh, who unfortunately uh, got into a bit of a, an argument with Mr. Beethoven and the uh, dedication was taken away and given to the great violinist Rudolf Kreutzer who apparently received the part, said thank you very much, stuck it in a drawer and never played it, uh, making him one of the only important violinists from that time until today not to have played this piece which has become uh, one of the great landmarks of the violin repertoire. The first moon is incredibly dramatic and the, the theme is well known. The final movement of the Kreutzer Sonata shares an interesting link with the sixth sonata, Opus 30, number one. The final movement from the Kreutzer was originally written to complete the sixth sonata, but Beethoven realized that stylistically it didn't quite fit. So he held on to the movement, 
wrote a replacement movement for the Sixth Sonata and eventually ended up using this movement as the final movement of the Kreutzer. Now the Kreutzer Sonata inspired the great Leo Tolstoy to write a story. The story is not based too much upon the piece of music. One of the main characters in the story um, plays the Kreutzer Sonata in the novella. And then Leos Janacek wrote a string quartet that was based on Tolstoy's novella, the Kreutzer Sonata. So if you're looking for a connection between Janacek's string quartet and Beethoven's Kreutzer Sonata, musically speaking, there isn't one. But the, uh, the missing link is the Tolstoy novella. The Tenth Sonata is for me, the start of Beethoven's late period, it occupies a somewhat different world than the other nine sonatas. There was a gap of several years in between the Kreutzer and the Tenth, and the mood of the Tenth is somewhat more reflective and somewhat more relaxed in general than, uh, than the Ninth Sonata that preceded it. The opening theme from the Tenth Sonata is one of these wonderfully compact Beethoven, I hesitate to even call it a theme, it's really just a motive where one would not think much could come of it, but rather very much does come of it. As Beethoven liked to do so often, the last movement is a theme in variations, but one that goes to a great number of very interesting and profound places. It's very exciting to me and Andrew that this project is almost here. Uh, it's been a long time in the making. It's been one of the great joys of my career to have had so many opportunities to play on the stage of Wigmore Hall. And it was several years ago that John Galuli, the director there, uh, approached me with the, this great honor of getting to play during the Beethoven 250th anniversary, his violin and piano sonatas. I can't think of a place I would rather explore this beautiful music than at Wigmore Hall for their wonderful audiences.